So, back in Romans 15, Paul drops a golden nugget in a peculiar place. And I can't think of another time that he says anything quite like this. It's in verse 15, 4. In fact, when we were at youth camp, Stephen Barber referenced this and then went running uh, to the Old Testament uh, to share the gospel through some Old Testament stories. But you'll notice Romans 15, verse 4, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. That's a super broad thought to think about, but certainly you can think about the Old Testament and the instruction that we receive from the Old Testament. We just don't dismiss it because it's Old Covenant walking in the New Covenant. There's things that we need to think about. And that's certainly, you can run to Jeremiah, that's certainly the case with Jeremiah. And I'm still trying to figure out how we can wade our way through this uh, because many of the sermons they preached has a lot of the similar content. And so we're not going to continue to hammer away at similar content. But I do want to go through what I ran through last Sunday night and give you some questions to ponder. And I've, when it comes to devotion stuff, I'm, you guys probably know me, I'm not a fan. Uh, you just need time in the Word and you need to think. And it takes time to think and sort things through. You need to find the path that the author takes in a particular book. That's a whole lot easier to do in the New Testament. And then you just need to walk through it and thoughtfully and carefully about how each individual verse is fitting into the whole of the letter and then the Bible itself. But I have found uh, in the Puritans, uh, they wrote in such a way as to ask you just tremendous questions about one particular passage. Uh, and I guess over time I'll try to recommend a few books. There's one guy in particular that I'm reading right now. Sibs, is that the way you say it? so deep in thinking about what the passage just spoke and applying that with, with you know, New Testament principles. And I'm just fascinated by that. So I preached through this last week. So we're going to go back and hopefully you remember some of the things that I said, but hopefully it'll help you begin to think through verses as well. And you do have to have a broad perspective about things and you do have to be familiar with the text, but... Don't let that discourage you. Just keep plowing and you'll get to where you can read a passage and go, oh, wow, I need to sit here and marinate on this one a very long time. Uh, that being the case, if you'll notice, let me break this down for you because we're going to finish this, this section. If you'll notice in 3 verse 6, Jeremiah writes, Then the Lord said to me in the days of Josiah the king, and if you'll turn over to chapter 7 verse 1, it says, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word. So that begins this next sermon that we're going to talk about in 7-1. And it runs all the way to 8-3. Now something some of you might notice if you're an English teacher, that you've got prose starting in 7-1. It's just sentences and paragraphs. But once you get to 8.3, or 8.4 rather, poetry starts. And so that's, it's the start of a whole new sermon in 8.4. He didn't just write prose and then jump over into poetry right in the middle of the sermon. That was the break in the line. So sometimes we see him speaking poetically, metaphorically, with tons of illustrations. And sometimes it's just black and white, which... This is my take on 7-1 now. He's stand, or 7-2, he's standing in the gate of the Lord's house proclaiming there this word and saying, hear the word of the Lord. He's standing in the temple. I'm not going to give you any poetry. I'm not going to give you any illustration. I'm just going to speak to you very plainly about the sin in your life that's going on in the temple. No poetry here. Let me just talk to you. That's my take on it. That, in, in that respect, uh, I'll tell you if I, I still continue to agree with that. But then when he gets to the nations, it's back to the poetry in 8.4. And 8.4, I don't, I don't think it ends all the way until the end of chapter 10, because if you'll notice 11.1, if 
you run all the way over there, the word in 11.1, 1, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah. So 11.1 1 starts another sermon. Okay? So this is a collection of sermons. They're not in numerical order or by time or date or place. Can't figure out why he chose this particular order, but that's how we have them. And so that's kind of how we're working through them. So go back to 3.6 and let's talk about some questions that carry us all the way to um, 7.1 where he totally changes and it's a new sermon. So anyway, 3.6. The word of the Lord came to me in the days of Josiah the king. Question, have you seen what faithless Israel did? And he begins to bring accusations against Judah, the southern tribe, by describing what Israel did, how the Lord responded to Israel in judgment, and now he asks Judah the question, why are you doing the same things? But here's the thing that you need to think about. It should be fascinating to you that God would send a prophet to Judah in the days of the greatest reformation in the history of Judah. And we talked about this last week. Josiah was the greatest leader that Israel ever had. He literally changed the entire nation. And God sent a prophet in the midst of the greatest time to tell the people, if you don't change your ways, judgment is going to come against you. So you have to ask yourself the question, why was God displeased? What does this teach us about worship. And that's what I want you to ponder right now. If it's the greatest day when everything seemingly is going great, idols are being burned, temples are being torn down, even special days and feasts are being reinstituted, why is God still angry? And so we have to ponder, well, what's worship really about? And that's the question. So I'm not going to... It's okay if you throw out an answer and it's not exactly right, but I do want you to learn to think about these things. Give me some answers as to why that would be. What does this teach us about the nature of true religion if God's angry in the very best of times? Right. So the external stuff, God is altogether un unimpressed. And so you need to learn to apply that to your own life. Is coming on Sunday morning a good thing? It's great. It's a great thing. But that's not really what he's after. You should. But what's he really after? He's really after the inner man and the heart. Something else that we were doing that you find out in this particular sermon is they were going to the temple and they were offering the sacrifices and they were hearing the word of the Lord on Saturday. But on Sunday or Monday, they were going to the other idols' temples and worshiping God with the rest of the, worshiping little g with the rest of the culture. So what does that teach us about true religion? What part of your life must it affect? Everything. Your worship of the Lord has to affect every part of your life. This is not something you do on a particular day of the week. Coming into a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ is something that changes your life from beginning to end. From Sunday all the way to Saturday. And if it's not doing that, you're not getting it. It hasn't clicked with you yet. Your religion 
motivates every decision that you make, every interaction that you have, every place that you go, everything that you say, everything that you do. That's its design. And if you've been able to disconnect Sunday from the rest of your week, you're exactly where these people are. They really were confused that God was angry. And we look at that and shake our heads and go, how in the world could they be worshiping two different gods and not make that connection? Well, how in the world could me personally go to church so many Sunday mornings and not make the connection that Sunday should reflect itself on Monday and Tuesday and Friday and Saturday and those sort of things? Examine your life for disconnect because your worship not only comes from the heart, but it, it pervades all life. It, it touches every corner, every area, every relationship, everything. It touches it all. And so, you know, we're just in verse 6. And these are the sort of questions that Sibs would pause and ask you to consider. And you're like, I haven't even thought about that. I haven't even thought about that. But once you said that, it makes a lot of sense. And I really got to consider my life and think, well, these are the best of times. You know, my job's going well. Relationship with my spouse is going well. I enjoy where I go. I love the music there. And the guy's pretty interesting speaking. And then you somehow just escape all that on Monday when you go to work. And think, okay, I got my religious part of my life right. I got the social part of my life right. I got the physical well-being part of my life right. And you're like, no, 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 you don't understand it's Christ as the foundation, and then from up from that foundation, all of life takes place as a Christian. He's the motivation. He's the foundation. He's the source. He's everything. Okay? And we have to mature in that way. You have to grow in that sense. This is what's so beautiful about the gospel. So you're there. Go, go to the right to Ezekiel chapter 36. This is something we have that they didn't have. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I remove the heart of the flesh or the stone, stony heart, and I'll give you a tender, soft heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. That's the tremendous blessing of the new covenant. All of a sudden, the Spirit of God dwells in you to help you walk through all of life in faith. The Spirit of God dwells in you in order for you to walk in a way that pleases the Lord on Monday through Saturday and not just Sunday. That's what we have in the gospel. That's why the gospel is so wonderful. God's written it on your heart. And that's the wonderful thing about conviction. When you do get in a conversation, I got in one yesterday I was trying to get out of so quickly because... It started out gossipy, it run all the way through gossipy, and it was going to end on gossip. And I was like, I just don't even be a part of this conversation. I'm out. I, I, no, I, I don't want to know. No thanks. You know, and it's the spirit that causes you to recognize those things and want to get out of those things and open your mouth to say some of those things and go, you know what? I don't, I don't want to know. No thank you. I don't want a part of that. It's the spirit that causes you brokenness when you popped off at your spouse just because you were mad, tired, hungry, had a bad day. And you go, you know, I'm sorry. shouldn't have said that. It's the spirit of God that dictates the things that you watch on television, you know, and on and on and on I could go. But that's the wonderful thing that we have in the new covenant. We have a spirit that lives within us. It's written the word on our hearts. And we can walk in a way that pleases the Lord. And when we don't, we have those wonderful promises that say if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness and keep right on walking. Right? 
So we have a reality that they did not necessarily have and they could never make the connection. But I pray that there's nobody in this church that can't make that connection. And I'm thinking, surely not. We have to be able to make that connection and draw that line. Let me look, or lead you through the next thing. Look with me down at verse 11. And the Lord said to me, Jeremiah, faithless Israel, that's the north. She's been in captivity for 100 years now. Faithless Israel has proved herself more righteous than treacherous Judah, the southern kingdom, which Jeremiah is currently preaching to. Now, why would God say that? What would prompt God to say, Israel's better than Judah? And if you need more backstory, I'll tell you this. They've done exactly the same thing. You can't find a nickel's worth of difference in what Israel did in rebellion against God and what Judah has done in rebellion against God. So why did God say you're more guilty than Israel? Because of the temple and what the temple represents. So what did Judah have that Israel never had? They had the presence of God that dwelt in the capital city. They had the temple. They had the sacrifices that took place. Can you think of anything else that Judah had that Israel didn't have? They had the example of Israel. Y'all, we've already been down this road once, Jeremiah could say. Did you not pay attention to Israel? Can anybody think of anything else that Judah had that Israel never had? I'll give you one. Time. It was about 100 years. That's a pretty significant amount of time to consider their ways and to do what's right. Now, I haven't counted the prophets. You guys counted the prophets to... Have you all done that part yet? Israel and Judah? You remember? I'd have to look at that. I know each had their prophets. But when I think about the prophets that preached in Judah, I'm like, come on, you had the all-star lineup <laughs> of guys that brought the word of God to you. You had the best of the best that came down here and preached. And you, you're actually going to do the very same thing? So that's them. Let's turn it toward us. What advantages do you and I have that Judah has never enjoyed? or Judah never enjoyed. Yeah, that book that you're looking at right now. How about that for starters? They have the completed work. And we actually even have it in our own language. Beginning to end. What else do we have that they didn't have? Yeah, I don't, no, they couldn't. They had a priest. They had a mediator. They had a temple. You had to go up and offer sacrifices and get him to make the appeal on your behalf. You can talk with him this evening. Curtain was torn in two when Christ perished. The Holy of Holies, you and I are granted access. There's no one standing in between us and the throne. Not a soul. They never had that. We have that. You can go right in and sit down with the Lord. 
and just enjoy him and talk with him. And he hears his people, right? Anything else we have? Huh. How do you measure that one? You got the Spirit of God that resides within you at the moment of your new birth and conversion. You have the one that instructs you, reminds you, corrects you, convicts you, <coughs> dwells within you. And no matter, I mean, you can't hide from him. There's not like you can go in the bathroom, lock the door, and leave the Holy Spirit on the outside or hide under your bed. He is with you and will always be with you. They don't, they, they, yeah, they have not a clue about that one. Anything else we have? Do what? We live on the completed side, so somewhat, of the gospel. We know the whole story. They had to wait to offer the sacrifices for atoning for their sin. We had a Savior to die on Calvary's tree. Everything's been bought, purchased, and paid in full. They didn't have that. What else? Hebrews 12. Thank you, Cody. Run to Hebrews 12 with me. Actually, 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the what? Hall of Faith. Right? And so you have a written record of all these individuals who walked by faith and pleased the Lord. You got verse 4, by faith Abel. Verse 5, by faith Enoch. 7, by faith Noah. 8, by faith Abraham. 11, by faith Sarah. Um, verse 13, all these died in faith. Uh, you could go on down to... 20, by faith Isaac, 21, by faith Jacob, 22, by faith Joseph, 23, by faith Moses, 20, 31, by faith Rahab, verse 32, and what more shall I say, for time will fail me. I've run out of time, he says, if I tell you of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets. In other words, I could go on and on and on and on and on. He, so he walks out of that example that's been written down for us. And then you roll right into 12.1 where it says, Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And we have a long record of the people who got it right and glorified God who have already gone before us and gone into glory. What else? Just like Judah, they had the record of Israel doing it wrong. We got the record of people really screwing it up in the church history of that too. On both sides, just like Jesse said. <laughs> We've got the example of Israel and Judah. <laughs> We've got the written record of everybody getting it wrong. We know what they did. We know how they did. We know why they did. Right? So, as you turn back to Jeremiah, let me ask you. How's it looking from an accountability perspective for us? You know? How is it that we might be so easily deceived into sin? How is it that we would so easily give in and just walk in sin and rebellion? Why? why? Nobody is getting any more than what you and I have received. There is no other side of this story. We're waiting on the return of our Savior. 
and then we're done. And so as far as generations go, you're a part of the generation that received everything that God was going to bless us with before he sends his son. The story is finished. He's given us everything. And so we ought to consider that when we consider our lives and walk worthily of the grace that we have received, right? To be honest with you, I don't know of any else he can do. I mean, I'm sure everyone was shocked as we went along through history at all that God was doing for his people. But now that we're a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and he is our head and he is seated on the throne and we receive the word of God and the spirit of God and we have the written record that we talked about in Romans 15. Everyone has gone before us. We have the example of Christ himself. We're done. The Lord is just looking for His people to walk in faith and obedience and humility because He has given us everything. You know, they had a saying. Look over at chapter 7 of Jeremiah, verse 4. Notice what the people would say when Jeremiah would preach repentance. Do not trust in deceptive words saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. In other words, every time Jeremiah would say, you need to repent, they would, Jeremiah, look back there. What do you see? It's the temple of the Lord, man. God dwells right there. His presence is with us. And you're telling me to repent? <laughs> Temple. Temple. It's where He is. We're fine. And so the rest of the false prophets would go around preaching peace and peace and peace and prosperity. And they go, this is the temple of the Lord. It's the temple of the Lord. We have the temple of the Lord. The thing that comes to mind when I think about that is Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I hope we, we never think upon that passage when we're living in open sin and rebellion and say, therefore, there is now no condemnation for, for those who are in Christ Jesus. I can sin. I can do what I want. I can live however I want. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for me. There is no condemnation for me. There is no condemnation for me. Stop talking to me about my sin. Stop calling me to repentance and faith. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I, I would imagine there's many people that think that way, right? They're deceptive words, right? If we've been born again, the Spirit of God is faithful to bring us to repentance and brokenness and faith. Other than that, it's just deceptive words, and which, by the way, is the prosperity gospel. Just continually preaching that God wants to bless you. He wants to lift you up. He wants to make everything in your life run great and smooth. He wants to bless your health. He wants to bless your checkbook. He wants to bless your marriage. That's all that garbage is. They're deceptive words. And it leads us away from the reality of how we're living our lives. Of holiness and purity and repentance and faith and all those wonderful things. All right, let me keep going. Uh, 3.15, back to Jeremiah. Now, if you'll notice, 3.11, he starts speaking to Jeremiah. 3.12, we get the context. Go and proclaim these words toward the north. Return faithless Israel, declares the Lord. Notice the first word of 15. I tell you what, verse 14 first. Return, O faithless sons, 15, then I will give you what? Who do what? So God's tied two things together. Genuine repentance 
and people who preach truth. It, it, it comes as like a reward for the genuine repentance. I mean, if you're going to walk in the way that you ought to walk, then I'm going to send you faithful men to proclaim to you truth and wisdom, things you can trust. No more deceptive words. So if that's God's response to genuine repentance, and that's one of the blessings that he sends, when we look at that conversely, can we draw a conclusion there? What happens if we don't walk faithfully, we don't walk in repentance, and we don't walk in humility, what do we get? False teachers. Look with me at, three, let's see, at 410. Tell you what, before we look at 410, look at 513. Because the Lord says a lot about this. Let's start in verse 12. 512. They, we've got to figure out who that is. They have lied about the Lord and said, not he, no, God's not doing this. Misfortune will not come on us. We will not see sword or famine. The prophets are as a wind. The word is not in them. Thus, it will be sword and famine done to them. And then Jeremiah, we pointed out this last week, Jeremiah recognizes that there's preachers within the body preaching peace. And I can't, I don't, I've lost sight of that verse. It's in here somewhere. Preaching peace that the Lord's not going to come and pass judgment. And when Jeremiah recognizes this, notice 410. Then I said, Jeremiah, speaking to the Lord, all oh Lord God, surely you have utterly deceived this people in Jerusalem, saying, here's a false prophet, you will have peace, whereas a sword is actually sitting or touching their throat. In other words, Lord, you know what these guys are preaching out here. This is what we talked about last week. They're saying peace. And you could stop this, but you're letting this take place. There's literally a sword hold, held to their throat, and these guys are preaching peace. Why are you deceiving these people? So when we look at false prophets and these messages that are being brought to the community of God that they're buying into, really who's to blame for that? The congregation. They're not following the Lord anyway. So if you're not going to follow the Lord, why do you want truth? What are you, what are you going to do with truth? Why would I cast my pearls to the pigs, so to speak, if you're not even going to pay attention to the beauty and the wonder of the pearls? Why do that? So if you're going to act like that, I'll just throw garbage at you and let you continue to buy into garbage. Which sent me to thinking... Y'all, I don't know of another nation that has ever been that it's filled with more false teaching and false prophets than we have in this country. So you've got to ask the question, why is that? And I don't think you have to think very long to answer that question. I think the reason you, you can't even flip a channel without finding a false prophet on Sunday, I, I think the reason for that is, is because the church in this country stopped listening to truth a long time ago. And the Lord's like, if you don't listen to garbage, I'll fill you up. I'll put it on every show, every program on TV and the radio, everything on social media. I'll, I'll fill you up. If that's what you want, you'll eat till it comes out of your nose. And that's why we have to put up with all these guys and women now that are proclaiming things that are lies because we stopped listening to truth so long ago. That's the only conclusion that I can draw from these things. But with genuine repentance, the Lord blesses for sure. All right, look at 418. It's such a simple truth.
You have to ask the question, whose fault is it anyway? Why is, why is Judah having to go through all of this? They're about to be carried off into captivity. What's the reason for this? Especially you guys that are so heavy into sovereignty. What's going on in 418? Eddie, read that for me, please, sir. Your ways and your deeds have brought this upon you. This is your doom, and it is bitter. It has reached to your very hearts. You did this. You are where you are because of the things that you've done. You walk through the difficulties and the circumstances of your life because they're the fruit of the way that you've lived your life. They're your fault. You've got nobody else to blame. Nobody will ever stand before the Lord whether they ever heard the gospel or not for any other reason than their own rebellion and sin. It's their ways. They're their deeds. And they have brought that destruction upon themselves. You are morally responsible before God. Shifting gears a little bit, look at verse 28 and notice, let's see. No, I'm sorry, verse 1. Look at 5 1. Look at 5 1 and tell me what is tied to godliness. Judgment. Huh? Judgment. Look at verse, let's see, the middle part of that verse if you can find a man, if there is one who does justice, who seeks truth, then I will pardon her. Then look over into verse 28 as he continues that thought, 528, and tell me what's tied to faithfulness. Faithfulness, not godlessness. How we treat other people. So we're talking about true worship, but we can't escape the reality that true worship is expressed in how we treat other people. He, he brings up orphans. He brings up widows. Travis, does that remind you of a particular passage in the book of James, perhaps? <laughs> you might turn to James 1, 27 and read that for me. Anybody? Carson, is that you? You're not there yet? Somebody read James 1.27. All right. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit the orphan and the widow in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. We totally forgot that perspective walking through this, didn't we? Because we've been talking about true worship true religion and we started with that thought and we talked about how it needs to pervade all of life. We talked about how that has to become, it has to come from the heart. It begins in here. The outward stuff don't matter and the Lord's like, yeah, the expression of the genuineness and the trueness is how you treat the other people around you. Especially the hurting people or the people who are in need. That's where true religion is often expressed. Not just in your devotion to the Lord, but in your devotion and concern and care for your fellow man, right? It's expressed in these things. And this particular generation was not concerned for those things. And you and I, as the church of the living God, have to be reminded we must be concerned for those things. 
because there's so many people, especially in our day, even in our community now, that need concern, that need care. Even if it's moving a family, Chris, <laughs> right? You just got to be aware of those things. You got to be available for those things. And you've got to have your eyes open and see those things around you and meet those needs. Of course, this church does, but I just want to remind you of that connection between faithfulness and justice and concern for the orphan, the widow. In other words, the category of people that have great need. All right. Now, I'm random with these things because Jeremiah seems to be a little bit random with these things. In fact, I just walked through them myself. Look at chapter 5. We went from 5.1 and grabbed 5.28 real quickly. But look at 5.4 and 5.5. You can borrow that last verse of, of last sentence of verse 3, they refuse to repent, then I said, they are only the poor. They are foolish. They don't know the way of the Lord or the ordinances or the principles of God's word. So I will go to the great and I will speak to them. For they know the way of the Lord and the ordinances of their God. But they too, poor and great alike, with one accord, have broken the yoke, have burst the bonds. They've all rebelled against the Lord. That's what that reference means, breaking the yoke and bursting the bonds. They've torn themselves away from the Lord and they've gone out into sin. So what is not a cause for sinfulness and rebellion? What's not a cause? Huh? Poverty. Sorry, but there are no victims. These are not socioeconomic issues. You're not underprivileged because you're a particular color, or you're not underprivileged or disadvantaged because of your economic situation. It has nothing to do with that. Your problem is you're depraved and you need a savior. That's your only problem. Jeremiah says, I preached it to the poor, but then I was like, they, they bless their heart, they're not going to get it. They don't understand. I'll go to the people who can't understand, who've had an education, who are intelligent, who are significant. They'll get it. And he was like, they didn't get it either. They didn't even care. And he comes back to the Lord and he's like, they're all that way. I can't, there's, not a, there's nothing socially or economically or circumstantially, there's nothing that's making a difference in their life. They're just all that way. And so we have to realize that as society teaches, tries to teach us something else, it's simply not true. Your problem is you're a sinner and you need a savior. And you have to come to that understanding. And until you come to that understanding and stop blaming somebody else, well, I wasn't, I wasn't raised by believing parents. I had such a difficult home life. I'm very sorry for that. I am. I'm very compassionate for that. But that didn't make you what you are. I had absolutely no good influences in my life. You don't understand. I'm very sorry about that. I wish it had been different for you. But that doesn't make you who you are. You see, we're always wanting to offer up some sort of excuse for why we are how we are. Well, I did this because of that. And you just don't understand. Man, I, I've had such a difficulty in this area and I've suffered from this. And it's, I'm truly sorry about all those things, but that didn't make you how you are. Again, your problem lies within your heart. There's where it lies. And the answer is always Christ. So please come to the point where you realize I don't have any excuses. I am who I am because I am who I am. And I have to deal with the Lord. And that's it. Notice 513. Uh, is it 513? I already mentioned that one. Notice 530 and 31. It adds more to this false prophet things. And again, I, I would have grouped them, but Jeremiah didn't group them. He's just kind of a rolling prophet from one thing to the next. 
Notice 5, 30 and 31. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy lies or falsely. The priests rule on their own authority. And, and here's the thing. And my people, what? They love it. They absolutely love it. So I've wrestled with this a long time. Is it fair that you were born in Joel Osteen's church? Is it fair that you were raised and had to listen to that garbage your whole life? Is it fair that that's the only channel your TV could pick up on Sunday morning and you didn't go to church anywhere so you just listened to them on Sunday? Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. You should have known better. You have a moral responsibility to, to understand what I'm listening to and what I'm believing in. That, that's partly on you. Meaning you've got to be diligent in finding truth and applying yourself and digging for it and opening that book and reading it yourself and listening and paying attention and asking questions. That is on you. You know, I think about that. You know, I, I'm sure we've all got friends that have been raised in some, you know, Latter-day Saints. Joy, they were born in the Mormon church. They are raised in the Mormon church. I mean, is the Lord really going to? Yeah. That's really on them. Got friends that are Jehovah's Witness. Parents are Jehovah's Witness. Family is Jehovah's Witness. I mean, can they really help that? Yeah, they can. They can read the Bible and figure out they're believing lies, right? So you have to understand your responsibility in, in the circumstances that you're in before God. You're responsible. I'm sorry that you were born in a lie and your parents carried you in a lie. And, but you're an adult now. And you need to apply yourself to understanding truth and be able to recognize a lie. And yeah, there are some that are difficult, but some are not difficult at all to figure out. Okay, You just got to apply yourself to figuring those things out. These people didn't. They loved the lies and they loved the faults. And they found themselves under the judgment of God. Uh, a couple of more things. Notice two illustrations the Lord gives to reveal the ignorance of the people. Now you spend a little time reading 520. It starts with, declare this in the house of Jacob and proclaim it to Judah, saying. And I want you to read all the way down through. Five twenty five. So five verses. We have two illustrations that reveals the ignorance of the people. OK. So the first illustration begins in verse 22. It is verse 22. And God compares something that obeys to someone who does not. So what's the illustration about? The tides, the shoreline, the sea. God says, I, I've told the sea what to do, and you know what? It does it every day. I set a boundary for it. Told it it couldn't cross. You know what? Don't cross it. The waves break where I told them to break every day. And then he says in verse 23, But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and departed. So the first thing is, God is like, the things... The things that don't even have life in them. 
I've instructed them what to do and they do it. And you who have life, who can't understand, I can't get you to do anything. Right? What's the second illustration in verse 24? Not so much an illustration, but a logical argument. You should be able to draw the conclusion from the logical argument in verse 24. What is that? He, yeah, you should obey the Lord because He controls the entire universe. He's the one that sends rains when you need rain. You ain't even thought about this. It's never crossed your mind. Crops need rain. Your cattle need rain. Your livestock need rain. I'm the one who sends rain. And you can't even find it within your heart to walk in repentance and faith. And I'm the one who does these things for you. So he gives an illustration about an inanimate object or, or, or something without life in the sea. And he gives a child's logic. If mom feeds me and mom protects me and mom clothes me, I ought to be able to come to the conclusion that mom loves me. It's that kind of argument, right? And so the Lord's saying, I'm the one who does all these things for you. I control the very universe. And yet you won't listen to me and obey me? That makes absolutely no sense, right? So when you turn the page, uh, judgment begins to fall. But he mentions three things, and we can move through these a little bit quicker. Notice 610. What have they done? 610. Should break your heart. What terrible offense have they done in 610? They scorned God's word. They took that book in your lap and they despised it. It has become a reproach to them. The NAS says they have no delight in God's word. I do not delight in what you're saying, God. So if I were going to talk to you about faithfulness, what should your response be to the book in your lap? This is my delight. This right here, man, this is my favorite place to eat. Paige made a steak the other night. Uh, she got it up at Windy Hill. That, by the way, is the place to buy meat. Got us a steak the other night. It was a new dish. She pan fried that steak and had all these things surrounded down it. You could just barely eat. It was almost like cotton candy. It was so good. So good. And when you think about the Word of God, that's the kind of attitude that you should have toward the Word of God. Man, this is just so good. This is like the best thing I put in my mouth all day long. Can't wait to sit down and eat and enjoy the Word of God. So if the rebellious despise the Word of God, the faithful ought to love the Word of God and delight in it and enjoy it. And that, by the way, is something you need to pray about. That's something that comes with maturity, but it does come. And ask the Lord that He would give you a heart that absolutely delights in the Word of God. Second thing that they were doing, look at verse 15. What is the terrible thing about verse 15? They have no shame. They would sin, didn't think anything about it. That's the unfaithful. How should the faithful feel about their sin? Because we sin. You ought to be shamed. You ought to be ashamed. You remember when your parents used to say that to you when you were a kid? You ought to be ashamed. Well, as an adult when we find ourselves standing somewhere out in left field and sin, you ought to be ashamed. And that is a grace and a gift of God, and that's something you ought to think, you ought to ask God for as well. And I, I, I've noticed my, my eyes have run dry when it comes to my sin, meaning I don't weep anymore 
And that's a great and grave concern of mine now. I'm afraid I've got a little too much in my brain and I hadn't paid enough attention to my heart because when you rebel against God, your eyes should well up with tears. Your lip should tremble on the bottom and you ought to be ashamed. Of course, you ought to go to him quickly in repentance and work through that and not stay there. But if the shame doesn't come, that's not a healthy sign. It's not a healthy sign. Third thing, last thing, 16 and 17. What's going on there? They're stubborn. You tell them their response is no. I'm not going to. Now, we've all been around kids enough to know the crossed arms and the defiance. I've told you what to do. And their response is, I'm not doing it. And so that's the unfaithful. So as the faithful, how should our heart be toward teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness, what should our response be? Humility and obedience quickly. Don't delay. Humility and obedience quickly. So we just walked through three characteristics that Jeremiah points out about the people. You have no joy in the Word of God. You're absolutely not ashamed about the sin in your life. And you're about as stubborn as a two-year-old. And so when we turn that on its head and think about what it means to be faithful, it is to have absolute joy in the Word of God, to be shamed at our own sin and quick to repent, and be as tender and humble as possible when God speaks to us through His Word. Those are the signs of a healthy Christian, of a maturing and growing Christian, right? So here's their judgment. I'll read it quick. It's in poetry, verse 22, chapter 6. Thus says the Lord, because of all these things, behold, a people is coming from the north land. A great nation will be aroused from the remote parts of the earth. They will grab or seize bow and spear. They are cruel. They have no mercy. Their voice roars like the sea. They ride on horses, arrayed as a man for the battle against you. O daughter of Zion, we have heard the report of it. Our hands are limp. Anguish has seized us like a pain as of a woman in childbirth. Do not go out into the field. Do not walk on the road. For the enemy has a sword and terror is on every side. O daughter of my people, put on sackcloth, roll in ashes, mourn as for an only son, a lamentation most bitter, for suddenly... The destroyer will come upon us. So that's God's response to all their rebellion. But let me take you to Calvary and we'll be finished. All that wrath that was poured out on them for their disobedience and rebellion was poured out on the Son at Calvary on our behalf. And we talk about things that you and I have that Judah and Israel never had, there's nothing more grand and glorious than the cross. Because if we didn't have that, this would be our expectation for all of our sin and rebellion. This is what we would have. We would hear the trumpet blowing that the sound of war is coming and it's about to be in. Yet we have one man dying on a tree that pays the penalty for all of that rebellion. How much should we run to that tree 
and bow our knees, turn from our sins, and put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. For He has delivered us from a wrath that is far beyond our comprehension. And we deserve it to the fullest measure. But what we receive is grace when we trust in Christ. This gospel is amazing. Our Savior is amazing. Amen.